And moving on now to our third expert speaker, Duncan Marshall, who you'll see there will be talking about the social and cultural values of built heritage. Duncan um, is based in Canberra, but was previously from South Australia and lived here more. Oh, I don't know why you had to go to Canberra, but anyway, very pleased that he's here with us today. He's worked for over 30 years in um, government, non-government and the private sectors. His work in heritage has been very broad ranging from local heritage through to world heritage, from simple individual heritage buildings through to extensive complexes and landscapes and from providing very specific advice on things like paint colours to assessing heritage values in a range of contexts, trying to guide complex issues related to the management and change of heritage places, through to helping to develop heritage tools like the Borough Charter and undertaking national surveys of Australia's heritage places. He's the former chair of the ACT Heritage Council and in 2015 was awarded the inaugural Bathurst Macquarie Heritage Medal, a National Heritage Award sponsored by the Bathurst Regional Council. So, Duncan, very pleased that you're here today and um, please join me in welcoming Duncan to the stage. I'm very mindful that this forum comes at a time of a rather energised public conversation about heritage conservation in South Australia and we've seen some of that energy this morning. And I should say that I don't fully understand the details of the South Australian experience in, in recent years. I had quite a lot to do with South Australia in the 1980s um, but, uh, and, <laughs> and when I lived here. Um, but uh, I, my, my experience has been uh, fleeting and uh, sporadic um, subsequently. Um, but I hope that the, the conversation that's going on in South Australia about its heritage and about local heritage um, can be based on um, good and broad-based evidence to support the conversation. In this uh, short presentation, I'll talk about a range of studies and inquiries that highlight community attachment to heritage places. Um, and it was interesting, actually, that Donovan's presentation, I think, uh, neatly overlapped what I'm going to say by providing uh, international examples about uh, some of the attachments that uh, communities have for their heritage places. Um, and I'm also going to briefly discuss identifying, protecting, conserving and managing heritage, um, but with a particular focus on identifying heritage places. So let me start by talking a bit about community attachment to heritage places. I could tell you many individual stories about community attachment to heritage places and I'm sure that you have heard such stories over the years or perhaps been part of and shared these stories. I certainly hope you have. But what I want to do instead is to present some of the broader evidence about community attachment in Australia uh, to it, uh, by communities to, uh, to its heritage. And while it is um, less entertaining than individual stories, I hope it will provide a more meaningful or at least a broader insight into this topic. And uh, there's perhaps uh, no uh, better example of a less entertaining place to start than with the Commonwealth Productivity Commission. <coughs> and for heritage people, maybe this report in particular. Um, in 2006, the Productivity Commission completed an inquiry into the conservation of Australia's historic heritage places. And by historic heritage, the Commission was focusing on post-European settlement heritage rather than on our natural or our indigenous heritage. In the year-long inquiry, the Commission had received 416 submissions and undertaken 17 public hearings around Australia. The Commission considered the question, what is the value of historic heritage? It answered this question in a variety of ways, including by identifying what it described as community benefits. Based on the submissions received, those 416 submissions, these community benefits were as follows. The role of historic heritage place in, a, in defining the cultural identity of a community, contribution to the preservation of community heritage, contribution to historic streetscape, neighbourhoods, etc., educational benefits, spillover benefits from tourism, um, perhaps with apologies to the tourism industry for being regarded as a spillover. And then it went on to talk about three different types of values, the first of which was 
what it called option values, the value to community members of having the option to visit the historic heritage place in the future. Bequest values, the value associated with the knowledge that the heritage asset can be endowed, can be given to future generations. And lastly, existence values, the benefits gained from knowing that the historic heritage place has been conserved, irrespective of whether the community members enjoying the benefit actually visits it. While there are many who criticised the inquiry for a range of reasons, and in many ways the inquiry has now been lost in the mists of time, and I should say that I was one of those who was critical of the inquiry in a variety of ways, um, the inquiry itself by the Productivity Commission and the research undertaken um, is of, I think, some considerable interest. It is generally worth noting that our understanding of many aspects of Australia's heritage is hampered by a lack of data. And actually the several, research, uh, several presentations you've already had this morning are very um, interesting because they seem to be data rich, but, but I have to say that in lots of ways we don't have especially good data on our heritage in Australia. What the Productivity Commission did or encouraged was research to better inform this understanding of our heritage. One such uh, piece of research was undertaken by the Allen Consulting Group in 2005 for a group called the Heritage Chairs and Officials of Australia and New Zealand. Essentially, um, the chairs of all your heritage councils at a state and Commonwealth level and the heads of the um, uh, government agencies which uh, uh, support those uh, heritage councils all come together in a thing called the Heritage Chairs and Officials. Uh, the Allen Consulting Group in preparing its report, valuing the priceless, the value of historic heritage in Australia, um, they conducted an online survey of over 2,000 adult Australians um, in order to gain a better understanding of the value provided by historic heritage places. And the results were as follows. 56% of people strongly agreed or agreed with the statement that looking after heritage is important in creating jobs and boosting the economy. 78% strongly agreed or agreed with the statement that my life is richer for having the opportunity to visit or see heritage. 93% strongly agreed or agreed with the statement that it is important to protect heritage places even though I may never actually visit them. 92% strongly agreed or agreed with the statement that heritage is part of Australia's identity. 80% strongly agreed or agreed with the statement that the historic houses in my area are an important part of the area's character and identity. And lastly, 96% strongly agreed or agreed with the statement that it's important to educate children about our heritage. In 2014, the Heritage Council of Victoria commissioned a literature review on studies which have examined community perceptions of heritage. The review considered a number of national studies, uh, including the one undertaken by the Allen Consulting Group, um, but it also included several small-scale surveys undertaken by local governments, as well as large studies undertaken in England, Ireland, Scotland and New Zealand. In addressing the question, is heritage important, this literature review found that, the heritage, found that heritage is important in community perceptions for both good and bad reasons. Let me explain. There was a universal belief that heritage is important and valuable to Australians, that heritage should include recognition of mistakes and negative events as part of that overall heritage story and that's important, that it is important to understand how Australia's heritage is relevant to today and to the future. There were two key phrases used to justify an interest in heritage. The first of those was to preserve for future generations components held to be important to who we are. And the second key phrase was to allow education about how and why things are the way they are. Again, uh, picking up themes which uh, are perhaps both positive and negative in, in the overall story 
of our communities. In addition, this literature review found that there is a growing appreciation that not all heritage is old, nor necessarily beautiful, and that the economic benefits of heritage are not widely understood. Though I hope, again, after uh, this morning's presentations that you'll begin to understand that perhaps heritage is, uh, is uh, uh, of great economic importance. There are strong and consistent messages in these various findings <coughs> which go beyond mere anecdotal evidence. Above all, the very simple message is that communities really do care for heritage. If I might stray slightly from um, good scientific research to my own very subjective views, um, I, it, it would be to say that this simple message about communities caring for heritage is not always very obvious. Certainly not as obvious as the days of the green bands and those other uh, great moments in our, uh, in our um, heritage debates in Australia. And I wonder if this is partly that the range of social issues today seems a very crowded field. There are so many things for communities to worry about, and you only have to look at newspapers and television to, to find those. It is only when there is some major issue or perceived threat that heritage pushes its way onto the front page of the newspapers or struggles for a few precious minutes on the TV news. It is then that we are reminded about communities and their genuine attachment to uh, heritage places. Perhaps the current um, excitement and uh, debate in uh, South Australia about planning reform and heritage is one of those occasions when heritage pushes past all of those other important social issues to, uh, for a moment or two, uh, regain some prominence. Let me now turn to the second part of my brief presentation, and that's to talk a little bit about identifying, protecting, conserving and managing heritage. And these are all quite big topics, and we could spend a lot of time on each of them. But I want to share with you uh, a few observations by way of introduction, and then to say just a little bit more about the task of identifying heritage places. The modern phase of heritage conservation in Australia dates, in my view, to the 1970s. This was the era, era of strong community advocacy, um, the green bands, and, and here we see uh, Jack Mundy being carried away in, I think, the rocks by the look of the background, um, from one of those uh, green bands during the 1970s. But it was also the time of um, governments responding and the development of uh, specific heritage legislation systems, the creation of specialised uh, government units to look after uh, or to try to look after um, uh, heritage issues. It was also a time when considerable thought was given to the philosophy and the tools needed for heritage conservation. Um, the Borough Charter was first adopted in 1979, and systematic approaches to the identification of heritage places were also developed in this period. This included local, regional and thematic heritage surveys, and South Australia has a long history with such surveys, and they are no doubt a strong basis for the current her heritage registers and lists which exist. Australia has a proud history of a thoughtful and structured approach to heritage conservation. Indeed, we have a substantial international reputation for this. The little town of Borough, and here you can see um, Market Square in Borough. The little town of Borough is widely known overseas because of the conservation charter named for it, the Borough Charter. The charter is a world-class guideline which has been used, for example, as the basis for the conservation principles adopted no less than by China. This thoughtful and structured approach has also applied to identifying heritage places. I've already mentioned the various types of heritage surveys which have been undertaken in Australia um, over the last years and decades. But other parts of that toolkit 
are things like heritage criteria and thresholds and the use of uh, thematic histories and his historic thematic frameworks. Without getting too technical, I want to offer uh, a few more comments about these tools. Heritage criteria are a collection of principles, characteristics and categories used to help decide if a place has heritage value. There are usually a number of criteria relevant to a heritage register or list, and at least one, but often more than one of these, must be met or can be met uh, for the place to be registered or listed in the given jurisdiction. Examples of criteria for state heritage places in South Australia include these few examples, that a place must uh, demonstrate important aspects of the evolution or pattern of the state's history, have rare, uncommon or endangered qualities that are of cultural significance, and that uh, the place might demonstrate a high degree of creative, aesthetic or technical accomplishment or is an outstanding representative of particular construction techniques or design characteristics. Historic themes are simply broader or more general aspects of history, such as developing local, regional and national economies, building settlements, towns and cities, the theme of working or the theme of educating. Historic thematic frameworks are a set of historic themes related or relating to a subject, region, industry or activity, which provides a framework for identifying and assessing heritage places. And the slide on the screen at the moment, which you won't be able to read, is just um, some examples of the themes which come from the uh, uh, Victorian heritage system, uh, which they have adopted and are using in that jurisdiction. Criteria and thresholds are used in every Australian jurisdiction and thematic frameworks are used in many as part of good, if not best practice. As part of a workshop organised by the Department of Planning, Transport and Infrastructure for this afternoon, I'll be talking in more detail, perhaps with some of you here today, about historic thematic frameworks in the context of the planning reform process. In conclusion. <laughs> Australia has terrific expertise and experience with developing and implementing systems for heritage conservation. This includes the development of heritage criteria and historic thematic frameworks. And I hope that the planning reform process can um, support and build on the community attachment to heritage places, as well as to harness the good expertise and experience which is available to promote a system for heritage conservation which is worthy of South Australia's legacy as a progressive society. And if I might just finish by picking up a comment uh, made by the Minister earlier this morning when he referred to heritage and character, it seems to me that um, in your conversation uh, about this planning reform, uh, you could do a nice focused piece of thinking and work to better define these things called heritage and character, because I, I respectfully disagree with how the minister characterised these matters. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a minister, um, and I'm a heritage architect who's been working in the business for 30 years, so... Um, but, but I think, you know, you have in your community, uh, amongst your experts, um, and more broadly, um, people who I think could uh, do a very nice piece of work um, in better defining what is meant by heritage and character to, uh, to help this planning reform process along. So thank you very much.